Like you can now say, come on, every demonic force, get ready. There's about to be an overflow. Every fear, you can speak to that and say, get ready. There's about to be a breakthrough. There's about to be an overflow. Fearless ones, get ready. Come on, we're about to see something in this city because I'm positioning myself for an overflow. I'm positioning myself. The divorce rate, I speak to you. Get ready for an overflow. Joshua chapter uh, chapter one. We're gonna we're gonna read a little bit in Joshua chapter one. Uh, we're gonna skip around a couple of verses. So if you got your Bibles, get ready. Joshua chapter one, and we're also gonna do Joshua chapter five. Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter five. If you're using your Glow Bible, your 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 phone Bible, you can just type it in. Joshua chapter one. Joshua chapter five. I found a new cool thing in the Notes app as well. There's a little scan button. When we put scriptures up here, you can scan it and it will be in your notes. I don't know if that helps anybody, but it helps me out sometimes to add it to my notes. Here's why I say that, because this could be your devotion this week. So if you don't know where to read in the Bible, start where your pastor's teaching and continue to grow from there. It, it's, there's God spurring something in this group of people and he's speaking to you something. Begin to read above it and below it and around it and, 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 and read it again. Read it again with God. There's, there's a difference between reading the word and reading the word with the author. So when you, when you get alone in your private time with God on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, because you know this church is not just a Sunday church, right? You don't have to just experience the presence of God on Sunday. You, you can take this home with you. This is just a building. You're the church. And so as you get in your Monday, take some of these verses, read around it, read before it. Amen? Amen. 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 Joshua chapter 1, verse number 1. What does it say? After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun. Moses' assistant. I came to talk to some assistants today. Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise and go over this Jordan, you and all these people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place. Somebody say every place. place. Come on, in the Greek, that just means every place. Every place. Or the Hebrew, actually. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you. Just as I promised to Moses from the wilderness and Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all of the land of the Hiviites to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able. Come on, no man. You don't have to have the fear of man anymore. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just, here it is again, just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and, what? Be strong and what? Courageous. Courageous. That word in the original language is resolute. Set your heart like flint resolute it's there's no other way that's be strong and courageous in fact in this scripture God speaks to Joshua three times be strong and courageous took him one time to create the planets one time to create the ocean one time to call the stars into existence but when he put courage into man he deposited it three times You're going to need a lot of courage to do what God called. You're going to need a lot of resoluteness to live out the call of God. Come on, I I know I ain't talking to any weak believers in the room. You're going to need a lot of tenacity to keep going, to take a licking and keep on ticking. Understand what I'm saying? Some of you have been knocked down, but you might say to the enemy, don't gloat over me today, enemy, because though I have fallen, I will arise. God's here to put some courage in you. And he puts courage into Joshua, because for you shall inherit, uh, be strong and courageous, for you shall cause these people. So your destiny is not just about you, it's about those around you that are going to inherit what they're going to inherit, because you chose to have courage. Some people are going to get blessed just because they know you. 
You shall cause these people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous. Be careful to do according to all the law that Moses and his servants commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right or left. You may have, uh, they, you may have success wherever you go. Good. Good. Joshua, Joshua uh, 5.10. We're going to read a little bit and then we're going to get into it. Is that okay? Okay. And um, you're going to get a lot of word today. If you're going to get anything from me, you're going to get a lot of Bible. That's good, huh? This is not about my opinion. This is about his opinion. Amen? Joshua chapter 5, verse number 10. On the evening of the 14th day of the month, while camped at Gilga on the plains of Jericho. Where were they at? They were on the plains of Jericho. They were camped at Gilga on the plains of Jericho. So they're, they're looking at Jericho, which, you know, from the Bible, Jericho is the city with walls. Uh, it's the city where Joshua and his army end up marching around, and they shout. Do we got to shout, fearless? They got to shout, and the walls come down. Well, here's Joshua, and they're on the plains of Jericho. They're, they're sneaking up to Jericho. Jericho does not know they're there yet. They're, they're, they're scoping out this place that God has promised them. So here they are. They're on the plains of Jericho. The Israelites celebrated the Passover. So they celebrated what God did in Egypt when he rescued them out of bondage for over 400 years. Anybody feel like you were in bondage in your past for a long time? How about 400 years? <laughs> they, were, they're, they're, they grew up in it, they knew it, their family knew it, and they were in bondage for over 400 years. And when God set them free, there, there was a moment where they, they're, 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 their masters would not let them free. So God sent a death angel into the nation of Egypt and, and that angel passed over houses and, and people were dying unless the Israelites would put blood over their doorpost and the death angel would pass over. That is all a foreshadowing and, 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 and an understanding of what Christ did. His blood over the doorpost of my life causes death to pass over me and new life to come. Amen? And so they were celebrating that. They were celebrating, here they are on the edge of the promised land, they were celebrating what God had done in the past. They were honoring what God had done while about to step into what God was doing. Amen? The day after the Passover, that day, they ate some produce of the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Now, that may not be a big deal to you because that doesn't sound very, that doesn't sound like, you know, sidecar donuts or anything like that, exciting. But for them, all they had been eating for over 40 years was what they called manna. And so for the first time in 40 years, they are tasting something different. They are eating the grain from the land and the fruit from the land that God had promised to their forefathers. Okay? So I, I promise we're going to go deep. You're going to understand it all. The day after the Passover, that very day, they ate some produce from the land, unleavened bread and roasted grain. Let's continue. Verse number 12. Verse number 12. The manna stopped the day after. When did the manna stop? The day after. So they get into the promised land. They're scoping out Jericho where God's promised them the first of ten cities that they're going to take on. This, they're finally here after 40 years of being in the wilderness. God is the God of their, his promises. They're celebrating what he did in Egypt. They're about to step into their destiny. What, let me ask you this. For you, what has God promised you? What are some things that you have on the radar of a word, of a moment, of a thing, that, a vision, uh, something that God's given you before you moved here. Maybe you lived in Kansas and you got this vision of you doing this thing and you moved your whole life here and everybody said you were crazy and here you are in this place. You had, imagine you're on the edge of that thing. You're tasting the fruit of it. And here they are, they're tasting the fruit of what God has promised them and the Bible says in verse 12, the manna stopped the day after. They ate this fruit from the land. There was no longer any manna for Israel, the Israelites. But that year, they ate the produce from Canaan. I'd like to preach a message with you for a moment, simply titled, This is your last meal on this level. 
This is your last meal. Come on, touch your neighbor. Say neighbor. Then say that. Ready? One, two, three. Come on, neighbor on the other side. I know you've enjoyed the food at your previous level. I know it was nice that God was making it rain from heaven. But this is your last meal on this level. Because after we taste this, we can't go back to where we were. You see, my mic's already getting crazy. I don't even know this. <laughs> I ain't prepared for my powerful peace. <laughs> after we taste this, we're not going back to that. We're going to a whole nother level. Neighbor, this is your last meal on the level of this anointing, on the level of this call. This is your last meal on the level of these relationships. This is your last meal on the level of this amount of fear, this amount of anxiety, this amount of depression, this amount of beating yourself. This is your last meal. I hope you enjoy it. I hope you eat your mouth full because God is about to dry it up because he's sending you to a whole nother level. And some people are standing and shouting because they're tired of eating the manna in the wilderness and they're ready for what God has promised them. And I, this is my last. You ought to toast. You ought to thank God for it. But I'm moving into another season. Thank you, God, for that one. On to this one. I'm leaving that room into the next. That was their last meal. The Bible starts out in the book of Joshua with after. It literally starts out with the word after. Any person that ever wrote a book besides the Bible never started their book out with after. Because that's confusing. Because what's before needs to be talked about before you could go after. But the book of Joshua burst onto the page with this one word after. After what? After the death of Moses. See, in order to tell you really about Joshua, you first need to understand Moses. See, in our generation, we're excited about our call, but before we can really embrace our call, we got to remember who came before. See, because I wasn't the first preacher in L.A. I wasn't the first one to believe for revival in L.A. Before I can honor what God is doing here, I got to first tell you what God was doing there. Because, see, I didn't come to dig new wells. I just came to undig old wells. See, we're not the first to run this race. We're just grabbing the baton from the heroes of faith that have run the first part, and we're running the second. See, you need to know that you're an after. Not an afterthought, but you're a part of something bigger than you. You're a part of something greater than you. See, there have been heroes of faith that have died for what they believe, sought in two for living out the gospel that we need to honor and we need to celebrate and we need to thank God for the Billy Grahams of the world and the Catherine Coleman's and the people that have just up the street done great works. And I'm not the first, I'm just after. But thank God that he saw me fit enough to say I can follow them. What an honor to be chosen to grab the baton from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, to grab the baton from David and Ruth and Deborah and the heroes of faith that, that lived out their faith in extreme ways. Do you know that the Bible is still being written, so to say, because God is writing about you. The halls of heaven, maybe they'll never end up on this earth, but the halls of heaven are writing your story down right now. And, and I believe Daniel's reading and David's reading and getting excited about who's running the second race. See, Joshua came after Moses. Who was Moses? Moses was a man who grew up in both worlds. He grew up in the palace because during his time, every young boy was being killed. Sometimes God ends you up in an unusual place through a bad circumstance. 
He ends up in the palace and he grows up with the finest of things, but he knows inside of him his people are struggling, his people are hurting. And Moses, he has a passion problem. Anybody else got a passion problem? That sometimes looks like an anger problem. (laughs) Moses was frustrated because he had a vision of these people being free, yet he was free and they weren't free. But God put him in the right place at the right time, but he took it into his own hands. And Moses gets mad at someone abusing and hurting his people, and he ends up killing the person. Immediately, the guards turn on him and his people turn on him because he didn't fit in either world. Some of you have that same feeling. You don't really know where you fit. You're kind of here, kind of there. You don't really fit in any world. That's, that's because God has made you for another world. And God is using you as a leader. Every generation, God raises up a leader that doesn't really feel like they fit because if you fit, you won't seek. And so Moses kept seeking, but he ended up in the desert because he was embarrassed and ashamed of what he had done. He's a, now a murderer, called to be a deliverer. God speaks to him through a burning bush. And Moses is afraid. Moses is afraid of his past. He's afraid of his pain. He says, God, but I know you're calling me to speak to Pharaoh, but I, 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 can't, I can't speak. I, 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 get, I get nervous. I, 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 I struggle with my mouth. Thank God God had told him to take off his shoes. He was standing on holy ground, really probably so he wouldn't run away. And God said, who gave man his mouth? Moses said, I, I, I know, but c- c- could, could Aaron just go with me? So Moses takes his brother-in-law, Aaron. What qualification did Aaron have? None, but he could talk a little better. Sometimes we bring along people that kind of mess things up later on the down on the line. <laughs> As you know the story, when they finally get out of, out of Egypt, Aaron's the one really messing things up often. Moses goes up to get the Ten Commandments, and he's up there for 40 days and 40 nights, up in the presence of God. And the people start going, did God kill him? I mean, you know, what's happening up there? They see the fire. And, the... and so Aaron says, I don't know what to do. Maybe just bring me all your jewelry. So everyone brings Pastor Aaron. You imagine if I left Pastor David in charge for 40 days and 40 nights and, <laughs> and I get back and David's got you to bring all your jewelry and he's made a statue of a cow. And you guys are worshiping a cow. <laughs> They're cutting themselves. They're trying to worship. And, and really the, to them, worshiping the cow was like in their minds like worshiping God. They called the cow Yahweh even though they were worshiping a false god, because back in slavery in Egypt, the only way they could worship God was to pretend like they were worshiping a false god, yet worshiping Yahweh. And so they brought their past into their present. See, the person that God did call to go along with Moses was not Aaron. His name was Joshua. But it was Joshua who wasn't down with the people It was Joshua who was always in the hip of Moses, just in the room. In fact, the Bible says that as God picked Joshua, it declares him Moses' assistant. I came to talk to some assistants today. I came to talk to some people that you're just number two. You're just an extra. You're just there. You're in the right place, serving the right area, but you're not number one. I came to talk to some assistants today who don't really see yourself how God sees you, because unless you can be assistant, God can't make you the head person. Here's Joshua, and God doesn't choose Aaron. God doesn't choose any of the others, even Caleb. He chooses Joshua, because Joshua is not afraid of being number two. Joshua is not afraid of just being in the room, just saying, wherever you go, Moses, I'm going to go. Whatever you need, Moses, if you need me to hold a sword and and fight, I'll hold a sword and a fight. If if you need me to lead these people over here, if you need me to go up the mountain with you, I'll go up the mountain. What am I saying today? I'm saying if you're too big to serve, you're too little to lead. Let me say it again. If you're too big to serve, you're too little to lead in the kingdom. 
I know in the world you can do that, but in the kingdom, God's looking for some assistance to give a raise to. God's looking for some people that, that are just saying, man, I'm just here to serve. Whatever you need, God. See, this, this call in my life didn't start here. It started me with just saying, hey, what do you need? What do you need, God? Anything you need, God, what do you need me to do today? Whatever you need me to do, God, I'm a servant. God, I want to serve you with all my heart. I, I don't care what I do. I don't need to pray about what I do. Oh, I'm not called to that. I'm not called to pick up trash. I'm, I'm not called to wash feet. I'm not, I'm not called to do this. I'm not called to that. Since when did you get a calling to be better than Jesus? Jesus was the servant of them all if you want to be great you got to be willing to get low God let me say it this way God's eyes are on this stage God's eyes are on the person cleaning the bathroom God's like oh look at that person over there wow they don't care if anybody sees but me but we fight to get out of cleaning the bathroom and to get on this stage maybe Joshua, Moses' assistant, Moses' servant, was chosen to lead the people. For 40 years, Joshua was stuck because of other people. They get to the promised land, Joshua and Caleb who the Bible says Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit about them. I, I believe if you're here at Fearless, you've got a different spirit about you. They had, a, they had something different going on in their life. And they go into the promised land with the other spies. And as they get in there the first time into the promised land, they've, they've seen miracles in the wilderness. God's been raining bread from heaven. They call it manna, which simply means, what is it? God's been raining bread from heaven in the wilderness. He's just, he's just, here you go, here you go, here's some bread, here's some food, here's some, they've been eating bread in the wilderness, and they get to the edge of the promised land, and they get in there, and God says it's flowing with milk and honey, with fruit, they get in there, Joshua's freaking out, he's like, there's fruit there, there's, 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 oh man, let me, t uh, yeah, those are good strawberries, jeez, uh, those are real, those aren't plastic or fake or movie set strawberries, those are real good, grade A, organic, I think, from the promised land, strawberries. I've been eating a lot of bread. There's a lot of carbs. These are the good carbs. I've been enjoying these carbs. And they get in the land, they taste the grapes. They're huge. But the other people that are with them see the giants. And they say, we look like grasshoppers in their eyes. The funny thing is they never talk to the giants, they just assume. Because really it's not the giants that think that, it's the person that thinks that about themselves. And they get so full of fear that they're willing to go back to the wilderness then deal with the fight of the promised land. See, see something we teach you in Christianity that I think we learn in a lot of churches, and, and you're definitely not going to learn that in this one, is that when you get saved, everything just gets better. It does get better for your eternal home. But life on this earth, the only thing Jesus promised us on this earth was trouble. <laughs> Many troubles. So when you get saved or you give your life to God, angels don't just carry you around now. Open doors for you. Show you signs in heaven. It could happen. Praise God. But God promises us that there's going to be a fight. In fact, what we really believe is when I get to the promised land, it's going to be easy. But when they get to the promised land, they need their swords now more than ever. In fact, when they finally conquer the promised land, Joshua never takes off his armor. He would have been like a warrior sleeping in his armor. In fact, one time Joshua needed the sun to keep standing so they could win the battle. It took so long that he prayed and he stopped the sun. Don't believe that your next level is easy. But you weren't called to a life of easy. You were called to purpose and to destiny. And so when they get to the promised land, Joshua's excited because it's everything God promised. But God forgot to tell us about the giants. 
So the spies come back and they say, we can't go, we can't go, we, we're little, we're small, we'll never make it. See, see they, were, they were saying the truth without God. Morals without God. The story without God, because your story without God is not a good one. My story without God is not a good one. Joshua and Caleb had a different spirit, meaning they saw the giants, but they also saw their God. And their God was much bigger than any giant. And they say, we can go, we can take it. But all the people, they, they, they almost turned on Joshua and Caleb and Moses and threatened to kill them and all this stuff. And so God got mad. God got the Old Testament. Don't mess with Old Testament God. Like, y'all read that? Old Testament God, you know, don't mess with them. And so God, Old Testament God says, they're all going to die in the wilderness. Every single one ab ab above the age of 20 is going to die in the wilderness. So for 40 years, Joshua and Caleb have to go back into the desert eating bread and quail. Just remembering the fruit that they tasted. Just remembering what God had for them. See, God will always give you a taste of where he's going to take you. Some of you got a taste of what God had for you and then he sent you back. He sent you back because he's trying to work out your circle. Some of you brought the wrong people into the place you tasted. And God's saying, hey, it's not drugs. It's not, it's not lust. It's going to hold you back. It's your circle that's going to hold you back. In fact, we got, we got to let some of your circle die in the wilderness. We got to starve out some of your circle. We got to break down some of your circle. So they had to sit in the wilderness for 40 years while the rest of these jokers died. You imagine when the last one finally dies? Oh, man, I thought that guy was never going to die. <laughs> he was hanging on for dear life, eating all the manna. Finally, one day, the last one dies. And during this time, Moses also ends up dying. Because Moses... He was going to see the promised land, but he wasn't going to get to live in it because God was also in a process with Moses. Because remember, Moses said, I'll go, but let me take my shady cousin called Aaron. Remember the end of Moses' life. God tells Moses, I know the first time you struck the rock and water came out in the desert, but this time, Moses, come here. Come here, Moses. I, I want you to speak to it. My grace was with you to strike it. And I know you're afraid of using your mouth. But I got one less test to see if I can send you into the promise. Can you speak to it? And Moses... Ah! It's the rock not once, but twice. And God says, okay. Your journey ends there. Was God being mean? I think he was being meaningful. Because the very next battle would not take a sword or a spear or a shield or even a staff. It would take a mouth. Because it was their shout that brought the walls down. God was trying to get Moses into his future, but Moses had to choose to go. Some of us, God is allowing his grace to work with us in things that we say, no God, no God, no God, no God. And God says, grace, grace is not opposed to effort, it's honored by it. You honor the grace of God in your life by putting forth your effort into the journey. It's a daily journey. It's a step by step. You have a patient God. It's the walk of faith. God has you on a journey. He had Moses on. See Moses? See Moses? See Moses? See Moses? Okay, now Moses, it's time. Moses said no. So Moses died on Mount Nebo, which I have entitled that never ending battle over myself. Mount Nebo. He saw the promise but never walked in it because he couldn't deal with the thing inside of him his insecurity so God raises up Joshua they're dealing with the death of Moses this is their hero this is all they know and God brings them into the promise and they get through 
to the promise. And the Bible says they all sit down and they eat the fruit again. This is the second time Joshua and Caleb are enjoying this fruit. And the Bible says that while they're eating at the table, God burns the ships. He takes away their ability to retreat. He says, folks, this is your last meal on this level. Here's what I'm doing, folks. I'm drying up what allows you to go back there. And I'm forcing you into where you're called to. God looked at the people of Israel and said, you've gotten too big for the kid table. You've gotten too heavy. What I've been feeding you in the wilderness is gaining weight in you to the point where if you stay here, you will break the system that now holds you because you're too big for this level. I've called you to another level. I've called you to another table. David said it this way, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. See, God preparing a table he's calling you to, but it doesn't mean everything goes away. It means the fight gets more. But you've been developed in the wilderness. You've been growing in the wilderness. You've been maturing in the wilderness. You see things different now. See, getting the people out of Egypt was getting them out of slavery, was getting them out of bondage. But the wilderness, its job was to get them into freedom. Many have come out of that but God's been having you in the wilderness to get Egypt out of you, to get your past out of you. He's been walking you around the same place, feeding you bread here and there. And you've been, you've been okay for a season to eat the Happy Meal. You've been thankful that God gave you a toy in the package. This was exciting and this was incredible. See, I have a neighbor who recently got baptized and, and he, he went through that because his girlfriend broke up with him. He got baptized, and then I didn't see him anymore at church. And I'm like, dude, what's going on? How come you're not at church? He goes, I got a new girlfriend. And, and now it's like, it's awesome. After I got baptized, like, all these doors are opening, and God's really moving. I was like, he's moving so good he can't come to church. He's like, yeah, isn't that crazy? And so he's enjoying the Happy Meal. But how many of you guys know there's a destiny on your life? See, there has to, for God to move you, he has to dry up the happy meal. For God to move you, he has to dry up that, rela- let's say, let's dry up that relationship, dry up that job. Some of your moving comes from getting fired from the current job you're in. Stop weeping at the table where the bread is stopped and start saying, God, where are you? And God's like, I'm not at the kitty table. See, one day that girl will break up with him and I'll be in my garage working out just waiting for him with some worship on. And he'll come over and I'll lay hands on that young man and he'll come move to a new table. Because at this table, the bread doesn't rain from heaven. At this table, you got to work for everything you eat. Yeah, the fruit you tasted was because someone else put in the work. See, at this table, God hands you a package of seeds. And he says, let me tell you, there is a lot of manure in the promised land. I know you thought of it as like, oh, I can rest, and it's like, it's like Cabo. I'll just sit on the beach and sip a Mai Tai in my dreams. But when you get to the dream, it's time to get the work on. Because God was doing the work there. Now you're going to get to be a part of the work here. And so God hands you a pitcher. You've been holding on to the pitcher that you tasted, but you didn't know the process so God gives you the process. He said, okay, in the promised land, you're going to have to plant the seeds. You're going to have to water the seeds. 
You're going to have to till the soil. Joshua lived in his armor. He fought for every piece of ground. In fact, the Bible tells Joshua, God tells Joshua, I will get, I, or he says, I have given you every place your foot treads. Notice he doesn't say, I will give you, which is what I almost said, but it doesn't say that. It says, I have given you. Two different things. Not in the future, it's already yours. It just depends on you, not me. Many of us are waiting on God. God's waiting on you. God's waiting on us. God's waiting on you to come claim some territory in your life. God's waiting on you to claim your mind back. God's waiting on you to take your heart back. God's waiting on you to take your freedom back. God's waiting on, he's waiting on you to put your feet some places. Maybe that's why the devil's fighting so hard to keep you stagnant. To keep you crying over yesterday. To keep you stuck right here. God says, just move an inch. It's a process. It's a step journey. That's why the Bible is a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. It's just one step. If you take one step, you put all of hell on notice. No, I'm just taking a step. I'm taking a step towards it. You took, you took a step today to come to church instead of the club. You took a step today to worship instead of wine. You took a step today to open your Bible instead of open your mind and say, I'm going to worry one more day. You're taking one step and God's saying, okay, now that's yours. Now that's yours. I don't care how long you didn't have it. The moment you step on it, it's yours. Well, I tasted it before and it didn't happen. You weren't ready yet. You had to go back and work some things out in the wilderness. Now the manna has dried up. You should take the manna drying up as a sign that God ain't there anymore. Maybe you used to come to church every week and it was real great to receive the sermon and then get out as fast as you can and get onto your life. And, and now all of a sudden there's something in you going, man, I want to stay a little longer and serve and help out and be a part of this. What happened? The manna dried up in the current situation, and now God's given you a hunger for more. Maybe you came to service, and you're like helping out now, and you're like, man, I just, what's that X18 thing? That sounds cool. Like, I, I, I've been wanting to grow for a long time, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, what, what's God doing? It's, it's not that where you were yesterday was bad. It's that God dried up that season, and he's calling you to a new one. He's calling you to a new, many place, people come here from other churches, and they say things like, I wasn't getting fed there. No, it's not that you weren't getting fed there. It's that the manna dried up. Because God was trying to move you to a new place. You don't have to be mad at the desert to honor the promise. You could thank God for the desert, thank him for feeding you in the desert, and thank you for the promise. Both are a lot of work, just different seasons of my life. God's going to feed you here with your own two hands. You're going to begin to plant your own seeds. And you're going to begin to see your own fruit come to pass in your life. Maybe that relationship, maybe it was, you, you understand, you could put this on anything. What is it in your life that you've been sitting at the kids table for over 40 years? For most of the people that went into the promised land, besides Joshua and Caleb, this is all they knew. Out of three million people that left Egypt, only two made it to the promised land. All the rest that went in were their kids. This is all the kids knew. It rains bread from heaven. I eat it. This is where I live. And God said, this is where you live for now. What is on the other side of that boundary line that you're so afraid of? That God is having to remove this to get you to go. It must be important. It must be special. Because God is not a mean father. It must be better than what you currently have. You just don't know it because you've never experienced it. But more is always more. In the kingdom, God promises that you're going to get a crown. He wants to put a crown on your head. Who gets crowns but conquerors? What is God calling you to conquer in the promised land? Where Moses stopped... Joshua continues. I really believe that we have a Joshua generation in this house. I really believe that we have a group of people. 
with a show of hands, who could say in this last year there was some kind of manna that dried up in your life? Come on, let me see a show of hands. I know I got the right crowd, that my iPad was freaking out for a reason, and the mic keeps going crazy. Okay, good, 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 good. Well, here's the cool thing. You're not alone. Looks like God dried up our manna together. <laughs> he dried it up all at the same time, so he's like, this is the way you go. And we go in together. But we go in with God. The first thing you have to fight in the new promise will be the hardest. But it will dictate the rest. Because after Jericho fell, the rest of the nine cities kind of gave up. Because they saw what could happen through a shout. Isn't it unique that the greatest weapon in the promised land was praise? You know, here's Jesus, and everything in the Old Testament is a foreshadow of the New Testament. You remember, Joshua, in the original language, is the same word as Jesus. So what the law, Moses, failed to get us in, what the law could see at a distance, Jesus brings us fully in. And Jesus is sitting at a table, and it's called the Last Supper. And he says, I am the bread of life. I'm the manna. What is it? Jesus. And he says, this is the last time we'll be together. I got to go make a place for you. But the comforter will come. In other words, Peter, John, James, the manna has done its duty in the wilderness. Now it's time for you disciples to go till the soil so the fruit of the Holy Spirit can come. The manna had to leave so that the body could begin to do their work. And today, did you know that today is Pentecost Sunday? It's the same day that we celebrate in the church that the Holy Spirit the fruit of the Spirit, love, peace, joy, patience, kindness, goodness, self-control, the fire and presence of God, the power in the upper room for the first church showed up to the church. They, the manna dried up, they left the kids' table, and they came made a place at the table of God. And the Bible says daily people were being changed from their lives. It's time to say goodbye to the kids' table. It's time to say goodbye to the happy meal. Thank you, God, for that season. Thank you where you just did everything. But, Lord, I'm ready to be a part of the story. If you're ready to step into your promised land, I want you just to stand up today. Say, that's me. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready to step in. Fearless Online Church. Man, what an amazing day so far. Right now is an opportunity for us to give back. We've been receiving so much. I, I don't know about you, but I've been blessed from what's going on in this stream and what God is doing in this church. Proverbs 19, 17 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, the Lord, will repay him for his deeds. This church is all about reaching the needs of our city and cities worldwide. In fact, last year alone, we were able to pass out 2.2 million pounds of food. Come on, somebody, that's a lot of food. We, we gave out food and we were able to pray for every single person. We also washed their cars, pretty much the modern day uh, version of washing someone's feet. Man, what an awesome experience that we've got to have through generous givers just like you. You may not be able to be here on ground zero level, feeding people, clothing people, loving on people, but you sure can be a part of this by giving your finances and lending, in a sense, to the Lord. And we know that you can't outgive God. I've found over 41 years of life that no matter how much I give to the Lord, He always gives back. He gives back so much more. No matter how much 
I release. I really believe that the spirit of generosity is alive in our generation. We need to meet people's physical needs so they'll open their heart so God can meet their spiritual need. Would you help us do that? We want to give out more clothing. We want to give out more food. We want to touch thousands more people. In fact, this year, I'm believing to give out four million pounds of food. Would you step out in faith with us? Would you become a partner today? Everything in life to get anywhere really takes partnership. Every one of us are here because of partnership. Life happens because of partnership. I have a dream that we would reach people's physical need to give them a spiritual truth. Who Jesus is, who Jesus wants to be in their life. That love that we so boldly profess as Christians. Would you pray today about your gift, whatever size, large or small, that you're going to partner with us once a month to see God do something incredible in a city. You can sign up for Fearless Partners today. Why wait another day? Let's be generous like our God and watch that generous God while we bless others continue to fill our, our vats, our barns, our, our dream, our business, our family fuller than we ever could have ourselves. God bless you as you give today. Let me pray over your giving as I believe people are moved today to become generous and partner with the fearless partners. Jesus, we pray over this giving. We pray over these people that are going to sow into this ministry. We, we say right now, God, Lord, as we lend to the poor, as we help those in need, Lord, that you would help those that are giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey guys, thanks for hanging out with us today. We hope that you enjoyed today's message. We hope that it blessed you and we hope you have an incredible rest of your day. God bless.